Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. When Russia first invaded Ukraine in February last year, the energy sector was immediately turned on its head. All eyes were on Russia's role as a dominant supplier of oil and gas to Europe. Since the destruction of the Kakova Dam in early June this year, however, it is nuclear power that has been in the headlines, and in particular, the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. What sort of installation is it? Might it melt down or explode if sabotaged, creating a plume of radiation? What would the consequences be? To help explain the situation and to separate the fear from the fact, I'm joined by my old friend and colleague Chris Skodonsky, lead nuclear analyst at Bloomberg NEF and adjunct assistant professor at the NYU Center for Global Affairs. Please join me in welcoming Chris Godomsky to Cleaning Up. Before we start, if you're enjoying Cleaning Up, please make sure that you like, subscribe and leave a review. That really helps other people to find us. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favourite podcast platform and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn or Instagram to participate in the discussion. Also, you can visit cleaningup.live to access over 160 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders. And you can subscribe to our free newsletter. That's cleaningup.live. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gillardini Foundation. Chris, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's always great to uh, to uh, have a conversation with you, Michael. I miss you very much. So um, for our audience, will we start uh, with me asking our guests to describe what they do in their own words? Because I do a little intro, but it inevitably kind of cuts some corners and gets things wrong. So um, what, what, what do you do? Who are you? <laughs> I'm a head of uh, nuclear research at Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and I spend most of my time writing research notes and talking to clients and prospects of Bloomberg who are trying to understand the nuances of what's going on in the, in the nuclear power industry globally. And uh, there's a lot of stuff that's in the press that's not exactly accurate, and I try to straighten my clients out and say, listen, this is the way it is. Very good. And I think our audience also deserves to know that we go way back. It was kind of the early days of uh, new energy finance, as was then before it was right. sold to Bloomberg. And I was running it and I thought, you know, it's all very well knowing all about wind, all about solar. Uh, and then we started to, you know, explore some of the other technologies and how it all sort of comes together in the electricity markets. But it really bothered me that we didn't really have anybody who knew nuclear. I was like the big expert on nuclear, and that's just kind of not right, because right. although I studied it, I was not up to date. And so we, you and I started speaking, and uh, the rest is kind of history, right? Uh, very much so. I remember everybody tells me, how did you get hired? This is why I got into a discussion slash argument with Michael Liebreich, and uh, he hired me on the spot. <laughs> so that was great. <laughs> Very good. So that and that that's going back to it must have been two thousand seven or eight or something like that. So you, yes, it was so a long time. So that was a life changing argument with me, and I, I I'm sure you were absolutely correct, and I was way out of order. You you took me from the dark side. I was a solar guy at that time and became a nuclear guy, <laughs> and so it was great. So so the the spur for the conversation today is um, the sort of unfolding situation, or at least the, the attention that is being paid to this Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in uh, Ukraine. And you know there are threats that it might be blown up, uh, but I wanted to sort of step back from them, the to and fro of the media coverage, exactly as you say you do with your clients, and let's understand, you know, what is this plant? Let's start with what does it do? How big is it? What technologies? And then we can go into kind of what are the real risks? And then maybe we'll talk a bit more broadly about the nuclear industry, Russia's role in it, and, and so on. So if that's okay, could you describe what is that Zaporizhia nuclear power plant? So it's the uh, largest nuclear power plant in, in Europe. It's made up of six uh, VVER, water, water, energized reactors, uh, Russian designs, very, very different from the RBMK design that characterized uh, Russia. 
Um, I have been inside containment in, in Russian reactors uh, recently, three or four years ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, these are good reactors, solid reactors. Uh, they've been operating since for 40 years nearly. The last one, I think, came down uh, in 80, 85. Uh, so there, there have been established sound reactors and uh, they've been operated um, somewhere below uh, U.S. standards or European standards for a, a capacity factor we like to talk about. In the U.S., we have a very high capacity factor of 90, 95 these uh, reactors have been uh, operated like high 60s, low 70s. So not really good credit for how well they're operated based on uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency data that I have ac access to. And just the, the, but these are pressurized water reactors. So the fundamental technology is just the same as reactors that are being run in France or in the US or in Canada or elsewhere, right? Two-thirds of the installed base of nuclear power plants around the world are pressurized water reactors. The other third largely uh, are boiling water reactors. Uh, for example, the reactors that uh, uh, had a problem in Fukushima are boiling water reactors. These are pressurized water reactors. Um, most popular, Westinghouse sells them, the French sell them. Uh, the Russians sell them. The Chinese have adapted several technologies. So it's a mainstream technology that is, is out there. And, and, and they're 1,000 megawatts each. That's the typical size for all of these uh, large reactors that are operating now. And you talked about the capacity factor. Why has their capacity factor been lower? Is it because they, you know, they keep breaking, they're not good? Or is it just because the role they play in the power network in Ukraine, or the role that they have played historically, has been different? You know, um, I don't know the exact answer to that. I suspect, however, that the, uh, the maintenance of those reactors are, uh, um, are, are at fault. Uh, the U.S., uh, is very, very good, have very high standards for operating capacity. We operate very, very high. In France, for example, they sort of cycle the reactors off on the weekends, so their capacity factor is somewhat low. So I'm not exactly sure of the uh, power demands within the Ukraine, but it could be that they're taking a longer time to, uh, um, to when they refuel them. They refuel every 18 to 24 months. So here in the U.S., we have an art to try to get that done as quickly as possible and we're very effective, other countries take longer time. But I noticed that you know, some of the reactors in the U.S. in the bottom quartile uh, are similar capacity factors, but the top ones that the, the U.S. is very proud of, we have 90 95% capacity factor. And these six units were built during a period they started construction in 1980. The last one came online in 1996. You talked about roughly 40 right. years. Who built them? Whose technology uh, are they? Uh, these are Russian-designed reactors, so Rosatom. And Rosatom right now is a global leader in supplying nuclear power plants around the world. They're building reactors in, uh, in Bangladesh, in Turkey, in Egypt. Uh, they have several built in, inside uh, um, uh, in Russia, in which I was visited one in Nova Voronezh uh, when I was speaking at a conference that uh, the Russian Rosatom sponsored a few years ago. So good reactors, good simple reactors. The reactor that I visited didn't have an elevator, very simple, straightforward reactor designs, uh, and, and typically less expensive, much less expensive than some of the reactors that are being built uh, in certainly in the West, which is not a good example of economically sound uh, <laughs> construction practices. That's right. So normally on these shows, we kind of go off, we spiral off into what is the levelized cost and why is this? But we're going to stick with Zaporizhia here. Right. Whose fuel do they use? Where do they get fueled and where does the fuel get? Re What's the fuel cycle from, uh, from, from, from processing through to reprocessing or, or waste? So <clears throat> they have been using historically Russian um, um, fuel from PVL, P-V-E-L. Um, but there has been an attempt in recent years to switch to Westinghouse fuel. Westinghouse is very, very aggressive in that market. Uh, first, we're trying to supply fuel uh, to that market. And um, there's been talk about uh, if the, the dust settles from this war with, uh, in Ukraine, that Westinghouse is poised to build, or at least they've announced that they're going to try to build several new large reactors. I, I remain a little bit skeptical on how quickly uh, um, that will happen. And also it's the proper choice for the Ukraine to do that because the whole landscape of nuclear power uh, with the infringement of renewables into the marketplace 
makes me think that there's uh, opportunities for other types of technology besides these large reactors. Um, but talk us through what normally happens. So that you said that there's a refueling every 18 months. Um, and, you know, I think our audience, just to be clear, some of them will be highly, highly expert. And they'll know all about this. And some people, you know, will not. This will not be an area that they know much about. What actually happens to the fuel? So how long does it stay there in, I don't know, cooling ponds? And what happens to it next? So typically when you refuel, uh, which happens 1824 or depending on the price of uranium, even more frequently, um, the, uh, the, the fuel is shuffled around in the reactor core, uh, typically will last uh, for six years in, in a reactor, but it's moved around depending on the fresher fuel in the center, the less, more spent fuel is moved out towards the printer. After being in, in the, the, the reactor for six years, it's taken out and put into a spent fuel pond and uh, will stay there for to cool down for for you know five to ten years or until we get you know these things brimming full and we want to take them out. After they spend the appropriate time cooling down in a in a cooling pond, they'll go to a, a dry cast storage on site and they'll move the reactors, put these things it's just like they look like concrete beer cans, so to speak, with steel reinforced and concrete, and uh, they're designed to keep the um, fuel cool and safe for 50 to 100 years, uh, perhaps 200 years, depending on how long it takes a, uh, a nation to figure out how to dispose of this long term or to perhaps reprocess it, recycle it, and put it to better use. Because the energy content of the spent fuel is there. It's just that being in a reactor for, for six years, it accumulates poisons, and that sort of interferes with the fission process. So it needs to be um, reworked, rethought. And some of the advanced reactors that are being developed will actually be able to use that as a fuel. So would Zaporizhia, at the beginning of the conflict, would it have had a lot of spent fuel, 40 years of spent fuel sort of gently cooling down, uh, well, some of it cooling down and then some of it in dry cask storage. Yeah, I actually have the exact number of that somewhere written down for you because I knew you'd ask that question. Um, there's something like 3,000 spent fuel assemblies, something like 1,800 uh, in, uh, in, um, in either dry cask storage or, or in spent fuel. And there has about 2,200 tons of, of uh, spent fuel uh, at, the, uh, at the site right now. That's on 2017 data. I wasn't able to get more advanced data uh, um, for you. But, but people talk about 2,200 tons, and they think, oh, that's a tremendous amount of spent fuel. People don't realize how heavy uranium is. And so it really is in very, very small places. I used to take students and, and analysts from Bloomberg to visit the spent fuel pools at the Indian Point nuclear power plant north of New York City before they close it. It's surprisingly small, compact, and dense, and comparatively easy to manage as opposed to CO2 going in the atmosphere. And this, the, the cooling would be then these pools and the cooling of the power station, the pressurized water, the water, the cooling for it, it all comes from the Kakova uh, reservoir or came from at, at that at, at that point, before as the conflict started, correct? Yes, and that's and that's why they built the re, uh, the reactors over there because they have a huge a heat sink in uh, in the in that reservoir that has now um, been damaged uh, as of June sixth, and the levels of the reservoir have gone down, which is causing quite a bit of anxiety to uh, some people in Ukraine right now. Now, just before we get on to what happened. You know, in this, you know, when when Russia invaded Ukraine and then occupied this plant. Just before we do that, I have to uh, sadly use the word Chernobyl. Uh, I have to ask, what is the difference between this plant? Just if you look at that engineering, you've given us a little sort of thumbnail sketch of the plant and what it produces and uptime and and con you know containment and so on. How is that different from the design that would have been in place in Chernobyl? So the Chernobyl used the RBMK design, which are graphite cooled uh, uh, reactors, which did not have containment on them. So something goes wrong, poof, it goes up. Whereas these have um, uh, 1.2 meter thick concrete uh, on the sides and their cylinders uh, uh, and a, a, a curve uh, on the top, they're 1.1 meters thick and plus 
I think, uh, 22 uh, millimeters of steel lining inside. So, so these are well protected uh, 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 containment vessels. Um, so that's a big difference. There was an explosion at Chernobyl and oop, it went right through the ceiling and, and whatever. Uh, that I would imagine would be very unlikely to happen over here because of the, the status of the reactors. So we, Chernobyl, we were operating. These are in cold shutdown, all except for one. Okay, so let's get to then the point of the invasion. So the, the Russia invades, and for a while, they sort of took over and said, well, we're in charge, but keep operating. But then it got into, then at some point, they were shut down. Uh, yes, well, <laughs> they were all operating, and, and uh, as of, uh, I think, the end of June, uh, the, and there was a period when it was all the reactors were shut down uh, in, in various stages. Or so the uh, maintenance people have been reduced by three quarters. The operators have reduced by one third over there. And so they're gradually shutting down the nuclear power plants because, quite frankly, there's much less demand for electricity because of the situation of the war over there. And there is some sort of tension between the Ukrainian operators and the Russian um, military that's sort of super um, organizing and, and, and running the plant right now, controlling the, the plant over there. So we have had um, five of the reactors in cold shutdown, which is the best place for them to be right now. One of the reactors uh, uh, is in hot shutdown, which is a little bit different, it means that there's still a chain reaction going. They're still producing cesium and iodine and there is still, uh, it's a much more dangerous situation if for somehow that reactive vessel was breached uh, than if they're in cold shutdown. Cold shutdown, you go ahead and you start refueling the reactor. People go into containment. I've been in containment and cold shutdown. And so so it's, it's, uh, um, it's a safer place to be. And the, you, you mentioned uh, iodine. And that's very important because that's very radioactive, but it has a relatively short half-life. So the five units that are, fully shut down, would no longer be producing cesium and iodine. So then kind of not dangerous, but the, but the sixth one, with some reactions still going on producing steam, would also still be producing iodine, correct? Right. It's in, in hot shutdown, it is, that's correct. And there are still um, those dangerous, uh, uh, the chain reaction is continuing to go on at a very, very low level and producing those, uh, those radioactive and, isotopes. And iodine is important because we absorb that very quickly into the body. That, that moves in the through thyroid, the body very quickly specifically into the thyroid. In the thyroid. Right. Exactly. Right. So what, one of the first things they will do is they will, will, will distribute iodine tablets or, or th for your thyroid to absorb that to, to prevent you, to, to help as a preventative uh, prophylactic measure to uh, help you uh, avoid the worst effects of that. Right, so we're having a sort of tomato-tomato moment here, uh, Chris, because you say iodine and I say iodine, but that's fine. <laughs> I think the audience can take their pick. But the, so what happens there is if you think there's going to be radioactive iodine released, you can give people iodine tablets, which kind of packs their, their thyroid and stops the absorption of the radioactive iodine. At least that's how, that's how I was taught it however many 40 years ago when I right, studied right. this stuff. And, um, and so... The one unit that is not in, in a hot shutdown, it's not producing power, it's producing steam. Why would you need steam? Why would you do that? Why not just shut it down? Well, <clears throat> my sources from the, uh, in Ukraine have told me uh, directly that they asked, uh, the, to, to ordered that the, the fifth number, of reactor number five be shut down. And the Russians have not allowed that to happen. So it seems like we'd like to have that all six reactors in, in cold shutdown. But my sources uh, have told me directly that that's still up there. They requested a shutdown, but they still continue to operate that, which suggests um, uh, nefarious intent, perhaps, on one side of the table. Because that was kind of my question. Do you need the steam because that powers uh, auxiliary generator or because it does something or whatever? You're saying, no, the only reason you would do that is to increase tension. <laughs> That's my interpretation based on the information I've received from um, uh, officials in uh, the Ukraine. And that's very significant because when it comes to the the, the dam, the Kakova dam, which was uh, which was destroyed or which which fell apart after lots of damage. What's very interesting, there's, there's a discussion about who who did it and do we have proof. But for me, the smoking gun 
is that that dam was being run down. The level of the water was being run down until about February 2023, when the Russians, and it was only the Russians that controlled it, turned that around and started to fill the dam. And there's no excuse for filling a damaged dam. It's it purely, it, the only interpretation that makes sense is to increase tension, to increase danger, um, and potentially then to increase the damage if and when that dam uh, is destroyed. So there's nobody else controlled the level of the dam. And what you're saying is nobody else controls that sixth um, reactor. Right. And to your point regarding the water levels of the dam, what's very, very important is uh, having water available to cool uh, all of the reactors and the spent fuel ponds uh, uh, at the, the, the nuclear power plant. Without water and without electricity to continue circulating the water through the cooling ponds and through the reactors, you have um, uh, unpleasant uh, opportunities. Right. So now, the, ha, so let's take those in order. Have they got enough water in that cooling pond? I mean, does the, because the water evaporates, it's got a source of heat in it, right? So have they have they got enough water um, despite the fact that the dam is down? Is there a source of water to keep those? ponds uh, sufficiently full? There is a, um, <clears throat> the reservoir provided water for the cooling pond. Uh, the cooling pond as of yesterday morning was at 16.2 meters. Um, the uh, the, the uh, canal to supply that was at 11 meters and, and bringing the water from the reservoir. So you have a situation where you have a cooling pond isolated now and at a higher level than the reservoir has been. And they believe that we'll be able to to provide cooling uh, for the nuclear power plant for several months. How many months that is, whatever. Uh, And so, you know, the the consequences that we feel good, we still have some water. It's not a crisis situation. But uh, if you were to lose the cooling pond or lose ability to move water from the cooling pond through the, the spent fuel ponds and through the reactors, then you would probably have uh, um, increased excitement in the area. So, so let's – and could you pump – I mean, you know, so the water level is low, the, pond, the level in the pond is higher. Can you pump? How, how big is the volume? What are we talking about? Um, I mean, if you had full control of the area and there was no hostile activity going on, would that would this be a really bad problem or could you solve it with some pumps? Uh, you can solve it with some pumps. The problem right now is that you have this counteroffensive going on and uh, yeah. that's creating increased tensions in the area. And, uh, um, and, you know, two things are critical for the safety of the plant. Availability of water and availability of electricity, either from the yeah. emergency diesel generators or from outside sources to continue okay. powering and moving the water around. And so let's come on to electricity. Do they currently have electricity? Were they to need to pump or, or, or for all of the uses that they have at the plant, do they currently have electricity? Um, they do have electricity, um, but historically, since the Russians have, uh, uh, war has started, power has been cut off to the plant six or seven times. I have a timeline for that. But we know that it has been cut off. It's come back. Various transmission lines have been damaged, been restored. The emergency diesel pumps have worked for you know, 24 hours, 36 hours. So it's a constantly changing thing. So the, 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 what's the worst fears have been uh, relieved due to the, the operation of the crew there to sort of tap another electrical source, turn the emergency diesels on or whatever. But this could deteriorate if there is... Uh, um, problems um, with running out of fuel or having other things that d- interrupt the supply of electricity to the. And now, the uh, International Energy Agency, uh, Rafael Grossi, has been there, but he was there some time ago. He has not been there to inspect at this point, has he? He's been there a few days ago, um, oh. and uh, he has, I can't remember the exact date, but he has been there, and he said that there was no evidence of, um, of any. Um, mines or um, ammunition or sab- potential evidence of sabotage at the nuclear power plant. He's concerned about the staff uh, that are tired. Uh, he is concerned the fact that you, you have no one seemingly in control of, of the uh, nuclear power plant. When Chernobyl went, everybody ran and said, yes, we have to solve this problem. When Fukushima went, 
yes, there was an organized group of people, a response over here. That does not necessarily exist right now because it's in a war zone and at the border of a war zone. And so uh, there, there, there's no clear, if something were to happen, who is going to come to the rescue to solve this problem? So let's come back to the question of explosives and sabotage, but let's stick just, if we could, with this, um, the cooling ponds. If they lose electrical power and they lose water, what actually happens? <laughs> because there is a lot of residual heat in the, in the spent fuel, it will evaporate the water. Uh, and so uh, in cold shutdown, uh, the, the time is eight or nine days without circulating water it will boil off. When you have a hot shutdown, it's down to 27 hours, according to the people I've talked to in, in Ukraine in the last few days. And so uh, it's really important going back to make sure everything's in cold shutdown to calm this thing down and that you want to have water available to circulate through the reactor uh, as much as possible. Right. So that that's the reactor, but but with the pool, the, the just spent the, the, fuel pool, the spent yeah. fuel pool, pool, the spent fuel pool. Presumably that evaporates off, boils off ultimately if you're not adding water. That's correct, and that's what happened in Fukushima, uh, where there was a lot of concerns about the uh, the spent fuel pool being okay. uh, dry and and melting down and, and whatever. So that's a concern right now. Even it's the probably, spent so the spent fuel can melt, but right. the thing that happens first, I think you're saying, will be the reactor, and particularly that hot shutdown reactor. That's exactly, that would be the, 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 uh, the first uh, bit of concern. And also, in the, the reactors that are in cold shutdown, you have their inside containment. All right, so, so if something were to happen, theoretically, the reactor pressure vessel will contain any radiation release or any problems inside the containment vessel. That's why you have containment vessels. So, so spent fuel pools are not as equally hardened. Uh, and so they're, they're perhaps more vulnerable to, to um, um, damage. So if, we were to, if, if we were to look at a potential timeline there, the first thing that would happen was, would be the hot shut down reactor might melt but it would be in containment then the cold shut down and then the spent fuel and it, but if that melts it's really bad because it's not in containment so then you do get radioactive release and some kind of a plume correct uh correct how big of a plume chris tell us <laughs> um the ukrainian and the uh, uh, ukrainian nuclear authorities have modeled um, uh, we, uh, they did a modeling in August of last year, 2022, uh, and the prevailing wind is from the uh, northeast to the southwest. Uh, so you're going towards Odessa, perhaps, and towards Bulgaria, for example. Uh, uh, towards uh, Crimea, and, as, cri cri presumably Crimea, uh, uh, my understanding, Crimea, Odessa, and then across Odessa the Black Sea. Yes, Odessa is directly to the south. I mean, Crimea is directly to the south of okay. the Russian so, might... so the the simulations that I have seen uh, in in the last couple of days suggest that the the, the fallout, the radioactive fallout, uh, and areas that would need to be evacuated are from a vector going in the direction of uh, the and, southwest. And how substantial might this plume be compared to in units of Chernobyl's? Um, how, are we talking about a tenth as bad, the same, even worse, uh, a hundredth? What, what, what's the sort of what was the, what does the modeling say? They ran several simulations, uh, and the, the the data that I looked at um, um, looked at uh, approximately uh, ten megasieverts, millisieverts. I'm sorry, really? not megasieverts, millisieverts, uh, and sixteen millisieverts in a worse, a more. Uh, worst uh, case scenario. So the range from 10 to 16 were the two uh, simulations that I had. But what are the simulations based on? How much is going to be released or what the wind direction is going to be? These are, are simulations. And so with the, they could possibly happen, but I think there's other uh, a wider range of, of possibilities as well. And, and what, how many millisieverts were released in Fukushima, uh, Chernobyl? What, what does that, how does that compare? Yeah, I, I um, I'm sorry, I don't have that data, but I but 
it's certainly uh, significantly less than in Chernobyl situation, uh, which was was very very serious radiation uh, uh, issue. Um, I think when I uh, uh, visited uh, Fukushima in 2015 or 17, I picked up a, a few millisieverts when I was driving. I mean, I was within 10 yards of the reactor uh, when, when I went there. So, and that's one scenario. That's the loss of coolant scenario. Um, what about the sabotage scenario? Because certainly the Ukrainians have been sort of conditioning the information space by saying the Russians have sabotaged it. They've they've put they've put explosives. Rafael Grossi said the IEA has not seen evidence of that, but they were not allowed, I believe, to see everything in that plant. Um, is it possible to uh, those containment vessels? Is it possible to breach them with explosives um, from outside? Uh, I imagine if you have a large enough explosion, that's possible, but they are designed to withstand the full impact of a jet airline crashing into them. Uh, uh, so there is, um, uh, there, the Ukrainians claim that there are explosives in certain parts of the nuclear power plant that Grossi denies seeing. None of his staff has seen them. Um, but uh, it's a dynamic and changing situation. And uh, um, IEA inspectors have requested to go back and revisit the plants to get access to parts of the plant that they have not had a chance to, uh, to visit. Um, it's an interesting one because, you know, the, the um, I mean, obviously, if you if you are in control of that plant, you can put as much explosives as you as you, you know, if you really, truly have access to it, you sort of assume that the answer to the question is, in theory, they could breach the containment. But uh, uh, but there's, that would leave that that would have to be quite a lot of activity, quite a lot of explosives to do that. By the sound of things, right? And and so what are, what are we trying to accomplish if the Russians are going to take some nefarious steps? You know, first of all, they want to increase the psychological um, um, horror uh, on the Ukrainian people, which they're really happy about having. You know, radiation clouds going ahead and drift by. So the best way, probably the most effective way to go ahead and do this is to spare the containment vessels uh, and to sabotage the cooling systems, the pond, um, uh, to drain the cooling pond. And so to, to sort of like drain all the water, prevent any water from being able to be circulated, damage the electrical access and emergency diesel generators or so, damage those components and let the water evaporate and cause the radiation release. To me, that seems to be the, a, a plausible way that they would do that, to destroy the water cooling infrastructure of the plant and the electrical supply to the plant so you will have uh, boil off. But the, uh, you, you don't have the sieverts number, um, but it is, as long as, it's, as, long as these uh, reactors are in shut down, even hot shut down, but in shut down, um, and particularly if the containment containment vessels are not breached i think what you're saying is it's a much smaller release than certainly chernobyl and probably F and fukushima as well uh, well chernobyl was just blew up the whole reactor blew up and, and, and was huge was terrible terrible that, so that's that's in a category by itself uh, and, and i'm sorry i don't have the data for fukushima i published on that years ago uh uh, it's a story I like to forget about what, what happened over there. Uh, but the reaction was, I think, um, the, the Japanese government took a reaction that was uh, warranted, but perhaps excessive, I mean, where the most problems came from people who were evacuated. So uh, I toured that area you know, a few years later and, and with other scientists from MIT or whatever who were with me. And you know, they, they judged the reaction of the evacuation of people as being overkill to just because they just didn't know. Yeah, so the famous statistic for Fukushima is there may have been, there's been one death that has been attributed, but that even that is questionable. But people died during the evacuation. Very old, frail people died during the evacuation. How big is the exclusion zone currently in Fukushima? Uh, well, I think they're starting to move people eventually back into the area. And, and again, I can't remember how it's shrunk because it's an area that is... There's such a, uh, a problem right now. The main focus in Fukushima is getting rid of the um, a thousand large holding tanks of controlling the contaminated water. And that's what's really dominating the news over there. And, and the Jap Japanese government is in this process of starting to release that sometime this summer. 
and that's causing a lot of international consternation from the Koreans and, and from the Chinese who are just don't want to see uh, treated water released into the right. Pacific Ocean. Because the, the, where I'm going with this is trying to get some triangulation. Uh, you know, how much, how big might the evacuation need to be, setting aside the constraints of the conflict, obviously. Um, you know, if the, if, so we, I think the scenario that you're painting is uh, water and electricity are out. There's some kind of a, 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 an overheat, probably in the spent fuel in that uh, pool. Um, maybe the hot, um, the hot shutdown reactor, but that's contained. And then kind of how bad can it get in terms of the, right. uh, the devastation? Um, you know, you've already got the devastation caused by the collapse, the, uh, the destruction of the dam. How bad would it be? Give us you know, some idea of that by comparison. One of the complicating issues here is that there's nobody in really control. And you have two competing forces, the Russians who are occupying, the Ukrainians who have a vested interest in, in making sure nothing happens. Uh, and so uh, if there is if there's a nefarious activity sets off uh, a radiation release, uh, what do the Russians do? They turn around and run. Do they leave? Do they practice a scorched earth policy and return back to Russia? Or are they going to stand around and, and, and get uh turn green themselves. So uh, the so there is that conflict. Who is going to sort of maintain? The, the Ukrainians would like to do that. The Russians are in control militarily. You have a counteroffensive, you know, guns shooting. Um, you know, there's the, the number of times that there has been, you know, artillery shells in close proximity to the nuclear reactor, you know, it, it makes it a very, very difficult situation to address how quickly the problem could be fixed. And if we don't understand really how well and how quickly the problem can be fixed, we don't have a, we're not able to really imagine how much of a, uh, of a problem would be created by, um, uh, in, in, by some sort of radiation. We're in a good situation where we have other reactions in cold shutdown. Um, uh, and if we were all in, in cold shutdown, we'd be in a much better situation. And if we had a way to ensure that there, there was... Uh, uh, water and electricity supply to the uh, to the reactors. I think we should be confident that it, 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 there should be less danger, and the IEA is really working hard to ensure these things happen. But in a wartime, uh, anything goes. Yeah, and I think that's what's very difficult because um, you know it's a situation where clearly, if both sides wanted to work together to minimize the risk, then that could be done. The problem is that that is not. Uh, that is not the kind of overriding assumption here. And we've seen, uh, as I say, there's only one country here, Russia, that could have increased the level of the reservoir prior to the destruction of the dam. So we have a, a, a suspect that does not appear to, um, to, to want to minimize the risk. In fact, the exact opposite, which is just very, it's hard. I mean, I suppose as an engineer, it's very hard to process that because, you know, we, 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 we live to kind of solve problems on behalf of society and not to kind of uh, in any way worsen them. But that may be what somebody is intending here. One of the things that people overlook the most about the nuclear power industry is that unlike any other industry or, or technology is so politically driven and motivated and there's all sorts of politics affecting uh, rational decisions that are going on in, in the in the nuclear power industry, and there's many examples of that. So let's let's follow that because I think you know we've understood the situation with Zaporizhia, and we've kind of reached the point where we understand the you know the the uh, the the how the plant is built, what the challenges are given the current situation, a bit about what the implications would be, which direction it's going to go. So let's move on to talk a little bit, if we could, about the overall. Uh, nuclear industry and Russia's role in it, because the implications of this, this situation will go beyond just Zaporizhia. There will be a, presumably at some point, there will be a, a, an end to this horrendous uh, conflict which Russia has unleashed. And, um, but it will, it will change the nuclear industry forever, will it not? Well, you know, I don't see evidence of that right away um, because there's not many alternatives. Who's going to come to the rescue? Who, which country is going to be the white knight. Um, Russia has a very specific policy of exporting nuclear power plants around the world. And there are many countries in the world, Egypt, Turkey, Bangladesh, uh, and others who are, who are um, very, very uh, interested in developing uh, uh, 
uh, nuclear power for a variety of different reasons. Uh, I spoke at several of the Atom Expo conferences in, in, in Russia and in Sochi. Uh, and on, during one of them, we boarded a flight to go visit a nuclear power station. And um, I was late getting on the plane. Um, but as I went through first class, there were uh, ministers uh, and, and senior executives from South, uh, from African countries. The entire first class, uh, first class was full with, with these, you know, political uh, staffers and, and, and people from high government officials from Africa. They were all being catered to by Rosatom to say, hey, listen, come visit one of our nuclear power plants and we'll show you what we can build in your country. So that doesn't exist at all in the United States. You know, you'll get five or 6,000 people at some of the Atom Expo exhibits in Sochi and Moscow, the two that I went to were, were full of people from all over the world. Uh, you go to, uh, the, to the, the Nuclear Energy Association meeting down in, uh, in Washington, Z, you get, uh, D.C., you get 800 people there. So they're really very, very aggressive in, in trying to promote this. On the flight down to the nuclear reactor, sitting next to me, there was a journalist from, from one of the leading Egyptian newspapers. What was his job? He's never left Egypt. He's flown to, uh, to, uh, to Russia, uh, has a blast three or four days being fed, drinking, eating, carrying on. He goes back and he writes favorable articles about Russian nuclear technology for the, for the uh, Egyptian press. So they're very, very aggressive and, 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 and intend to be a leader in, in selling um, nuclear reactors around the world. What also has happened is that they've really cornered a very large percentage of the nuclear fuel enrichment business. Not so much the uranium. Uh, they had about 8% of the, uh, of the um, recoverable uh, at a certain price uranium supplies around the world, but they dominate uranium enrichment. And uh, it's a problem that could easily be solved by the U.S. if we decide to go ahead and, and invest in a uranium enrichment facility. But, you know, we don't seem to be able, the political machine in the United States is bogged down. We can't sort of get off going. There's several different approaches to doing that. We've got, we, we, we're trying to create an enrichment for, for HALU, for these advanced reactors. And, you know, we're going to get like, you know, 20 kilos of HALU this year when, you know, the demands for it are huge. And, and we're just, it's, it's a combination of their chicken and egg situation. The, the Richmond companies do not want to invest in a further Richmond facility unless they can see demand for the technology. And as a result of that, some of these advanced reactors, the, the day when they can come online is being pushed further and further back because of the lack of available fuel. It's a policy problem. Let's take a step back on Halu, um, and and let's start, if we could, just on the fuel cycle for the, the benefit of this audience. Um, you know, I was in the Soviet Union in 1990. I actually worked on Perestroika. Uh, so that was the year before the Soviet Union just completely co collapsed. Um, and in that collapse, which was enormously chaotic, one of the things that happened, thankfully, was uh, the deal. Uh, by the West, led by the U.S., to go in and, and do a uh, uh, megatons to megawatts to take the, some of the uh, enormous overcapacity surplus of nuclear warheads and turn that and you uh, sort of get cap get it uh, get get their arms around it and bring it into the fuel cycle. Correct. You're correct. But but that was something called HEU, not the HALU, which is H-A-L-E-U, that, that you've just been speaking about. Yeah, so H-E-U is highly enriched uranium, which would be suitable 95% uh, concentration of the isotope uranium-235, which is fissile as opposed to the uranium-238, which is the isotope that's fertile. And so you need that fissile uh, uh, component to be very, very high for nuclear weapons development. So we took, in, through the megatons uh, to megawatts process, we took that highly, uh, highly rich uranium and downblended it, mixed it back with, with, with other uranium isotopes to bring it down to an enrichment level that was suitable for uh, operating U.S. nuclear power plants. U.S. nuclear power plants use uranium enriched to 35 to 5%, uh, and uh, that's pretty much of a standard for that. Now, the advanced reactors are going to be requiring 
HALU, high assay, low enriched uranium, which provides enrichment levels between uh, up to 19.5%, 20% or so like that. So they'll be able to operate for longer periods of time without refueling, um, to be, be more efficient and uh, be more economical, allegedly, by, by able to use this, this, um, this higher um, uh, assay fuel. And, and of the, there's a sort of Precambrian explosion of different types of plants, different, uh, the small modular reactors, micro reactors, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody's got, a, everybody's got their favorite reactor design. How many of them use Halu? Halu? Um, nine of the 10 advanced reactors that are being designed or, or being developed in the United States um, will use HALU. Uh, and who, con- who controls the HALU uh, supply chain? Our friends in Russia. Right. And you said that then there's been, there are sort of, there are a number of moves. I also know that um, uh, under the Inflation React, uh, Reduction Act, and there's been another sort of few billion thrown at this problem, but to produce HALU uh, domestically in the US, correct? Correct. And, so, and what you're saying is too little, too late, fiddling around the edges, not serious. Uh, I would start by saying not serious, and it's a question of money. Uh, who is so to to build up a um, a halo enrichment facility is going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Where is the prop, Where is the demand for that coming? It's going to come um, uh, in the future. So when you're talking to investors about raising this type of cash to invest in, in a, a a technology that's very expensive that has a very long lead time and may not produce results. Um, it, it's it's a pretty risky proposition. Uh, another thing that I think is probably wise to sort of understand is that you mentioned yourself that there's 35, 40 advanced reactor designs being developed. So what percentage of them are actually going to cross the finish line and produce a reactor that is going to uh, have a market and demand for HALU fuel? And so I'm very, very suspicious that a lot of these will not be able to cross cross the finish line simply because of the capital requirements and the licensing and and regulation gauntlet that they'll need to run through to go ahead and deliver that. So I am very, very um, concerned that a lot of the efforts that um, we see being developed in the advanced reactor space will not have enough cash and enough legs and will run through a tremendously difficult gauntlet to, to, to get, uh, or get across the finish line. A month or two after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, very soon after, so this would have been in March, April of 2022, I went to an event which was on the security implications of the Russian invasion. And there was a, there were two main speakers. One was a former oil and gas CEO who said that we were foolish to support Ukraine because all his friends were still partying in Moscow, which I thought was an offensively tin-eared thing to say. The other person was a former head of a security service. I can't say too much about it because we'll, you'd be able to kind of work out who it was. And when he was asked what the solution was from an energy security perspective to these developments, he cleared his throat and in a very portentous voice said the solution to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the energy security issues that they raised was SMRs. And I nearly spat my coffee. Do you think SMRs, I mean, from what you're saying is you have grave reservations uh, about the technologies and whether they're funded to get through to be built, but then also nine out of 10 of them use a fuel which is controlled by Russia. Let's say um, I'm nervous uh, about the prospects of that. Um, you know, the history of building large reactors in the West is rather dismal in the last few years. You have several examples in the United States, Vogel 3 and 4. They, I think they, they have the prize in my analysis of the most expensive reactor on a per kilowatt basis, Okay. Uh, and then the French have the, the episode in uh, Okiloto, and uh, you know which started construction in 2005. Uh, and if you're starting a capital project in 2005 and it's still not generating electricity, 
or has just started electric generating electricity, just can imagine the uh, uh, what that does to the levelized cost of electricity on that product. And then the French started in 2007, and they're lucky to get the reactor online in 2024. And we also experienced situation in Hinkley where the uh, the project is behind schedule, over budget, and uh, quite frankly. I question whether or not it was the right fit for nuclear in the UK. What has changed in the last 10 or 15 years is all of a sudden we have this tremendous increase of, of renewable energy capacity. And so we need to find nuclear reactors that can complement um, that deployment of uh, advanced uh, of renewable energy uh, and large reactors pushing 1.6 gigawatts on and off the grid, reducing output, is a very, very inefficient. The penetration of renewables onto the grid has changed the type of nuclear reactor that the, the utilities will ask for in the future. It's going to be a smaller reactor, it's going to be an agile reactor, and it's a reactor that will be able to be deployed to, uh, to respond to intermittency, uh, of, of demand and will have other p opportunities to provide uh, industrial heat and will also provide hydrogen uh, um, and desalination in markets where uh, it is necessary. As, and that has been my hypothesis, but all of a sudden we see that uh, in an attempt to completely decarbonize its electrical power infrastructure, the Canadians are investigating adding 4.8 gigawatts of nuclear power in Ontario uh, with all large reactors. I um, will be wrong because I thought that we, would, we have seen the end of large reactors in, in North America in preference for smaller reactors, which can better complement the increasing deployment of, of renewables. The biggest challenge I see uh, for SMR development is one having the deep pocket that is necessary to uh, to 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 support and develop those 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 technologies and the regulatory gauntlet that is in front of them, which is very very problematic. You know, you're looking to sort of raise capital to build an SMR and get a license and regulation, and um, you uh, asking uh, private equity or or whoever for cash to go ahead and invest that. And they say, well, what are you going to do with the cash? Well, we're going to give it to the U.S. government to pay for the regulatory fees. And they'll say, yes, that's a very good idea. Here's plenty of money to go ahead and do it. Of course not, okay? And so there, I, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that we don't see that uh, all this, a lot of advanced reactive developments, not all will cross the finish line, lack of capital and the challenges they'll face. So I did an episode um, which has just come out this week with Fatih Birol, the head of the IEA, and he was commending the kind of resurgence of interest in nuclear, the combination of SMRs and then potentially even larger uh, reactors. And he was pointing out that even if they are not um, fully competitive on a kind of kilowatt hour for kilowatt hour basis, that there were strategic reasons why they were good because of diversity of supply and that countries would kind of want some anyway. And I suppose that's kind of where we end up. Well, I remember one of the Bloomberg summits, I had a conversation with Jim Rogers, the former CEO of Duke Energy. And I asked him, um, and this is the, the, the era of very inexpensive natural gas. And I asked him, what price premium is a utility willing to pay to diversify its supply or portfolio of generating assets? And he looked at me and says, Chris, I don't have a good answer for you, but it's a really good question. And so I think that we're going to see utilities in the U.S. and elsewhere trying to make decisions that are based on trying to reach um, net zero aspirations that are going to confuse the, the economics. And what premium, how much more are they willing to pay? To diversify the portfolio generation uh, and and to to hedge against future disruptions in fossil fuel prices, um, and I think that's probably something that, again, taking the economics purely out of the decision making process and and looking at the political considerations are something that is going to affect nuclear decision makers more um, uh, than they have in the past. And just coming back to 
Russia and its role in that global industry? Because uh, you said some very striking things that, that Russia is very aggressively promoting uh, reactor construction in some countries where uh, US or, or, or other manufacturers are probably not going to be prepared to, maybe not prepared to sell, but maybe not prepared simply to put in the hard yards to do the selling. Um, what happens is we, you know, right now there are sanctions which are being tightened on Russia across the board, except on the nuclear industry. I mean, is that just kind of real politic of saying, frankly, you know, in the corridors of power, they've thought all this through and they kind of agree with, you know, that worldview that we're not, you know, that, that we need Russia. Russia is going to do this stuff and uh, we need the fuel. And so we're just kind of going to shrug our shoulders and in nuclear, at least, continue with business as usual? Um, one of my first steps uh, uh, in my energy career was doing some work for the United Nations Development Program in Egypt and Somalia, advising them, as a matter of fact, on, on uh, developing their solar industries. And uh, I was uh, brought to my attention that decisions are made for political reasons that you have no understanding of why they made that decision. And, and I can understand making decisions based on economics, but when it comes to making decisions based on politics, sometimes you just throw up your hands. So I don't understand why that is. And one could even look at the UK in the decision to build Hinkley. Both you and I at the time were very disappointed that they chose that option. But it was a political decision, in my opinion, because it was a way to create 25,000 jobs, which uh, Cameron Sarkozy thought was a very, very attractive thing to do. So it was not so much, how can we generate the least amount, less expensive electricity, but how can we put 25,000 people to work? That's an interesting one. I, I actually diverged. I, mean, I, I, I thought that was the most ridiculous deal. Ed Davey negotiated it uh, uh, at the time. Uh, George Osborne, who was chancellor, seems to have ratified it. Um, completely absurd deal. I don't think it was the jobs. I actually think on the, uh, from the conservatives that were, uh, you know, in, in government at the time in coalition with, with Ed Davey, that was a Lib Dem. I actually think that the conservative push was because at the time people were leaving, conservative voters were being attracted over into UKIP, the UK Independence Party. And one of the big platforms there was, you know, let's let's do manly nuclear power and not this kind of rather effete renewables that everybody else wants to do. And so we did some nuclear at any cost. And I think there was a big part of that. Um, but I I just I mean, I, I hope it's a kind of I mean, it's not a, it's not a rosy picture that you paint overall of the industry. Uh, thanks for your insights into Zaporizhia, which are actually are probably quite reassuring, but the overall picture of the industry is not very uh, positive. Um, I hope you're not regretting that I pulled you back into nuclear from solar. You said that you were happily working away on solar when I uh, called you back in 2007, 2008, and we got into that uh, discussion. I'm absolutely fascinated with the challenges that uh, I face in understanding what's going on in the nuclear power industry. And uh, I'm long past retirement age and very happy to continue doing what I'm doing. Uh, and I'm fascinated by how things, uh, um, I, I want us to sort of society, I believe that net zero has to have a fission or fusion component going forward. And uh, for us to, for, uh, and I also question all these net zero aspirations. I mean, without fission or fusion, I really question how they're going to cross the finish line. And I'm very, very impressed um, about some of the things I'm seeing in the fusion uh, space, uh, having visited um, ITER, Commonwealth Fusion, TA Technology. I have a seven or eight com fusion, fusion companies that visited. And I sense in the fusion companies that there's a tremendous amount of excitement they're very well capitalized. I mean, $2.2 billion goes a long way to sort of commercialize a, uh, a, a fusion power plant, prove its prototype. And there's a drive and an interest and excitement there that I find lacking in a lot of the advanced reactor companies. And so I'm sort of very, very curious to see how fusion will be able to contribute. Because if you had a fusion plant in Zaporizhia as opposed to a fusion plant, you wouldn't have a lot of these worries that we're talking about.
Yeah, you'd probably have some radioactive um, uh, vessel linings sort of sitting around somewhere that have been zapped by high energy particles for six months. And now you don't know quite what to do with them. But they wouldn't be the same fuels sitting there in those pools. Um, that's a really interesting thought. I mean, we could um, I think we could do another we could do another uh, 50 minutes on on fusion. But I guess I'll boil it down to one question. Um, 2050. What percentage of global electricity do you think will be coming from fusion? Uh, I won't be able to answer that question because it'd be just a wild guess. But I'll tell you, fusion is closer than you think. And there are several reasons I believe that. One is that you have a critical mass and people uh, are uh, interested in, in, in investing in that. $2.2 billion for one company. Let's see how they play it out. Secondly, there's also no regulatory uh, gauntlet that they have to run through because the way they're licensing fusion facilities is very, very different from the way they're doing that. And uh, I think that um, there's a lot of different approaches. There's many shots on goal, and it, that's a sign of a very, very healthy industry. It's not one way of doing it. There's several different ways. And I think that, um, uh, you know, to be an optimist uh, if with nuclear space, that's one area that I'm sort of looking at. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, I could, I, I could, in fact, I, you know, I would, I would normally push back in great detail, but because I don't think two point two billion is very much, uh, uh, given the the, we did a very good episode with Anika Khan on some of the materials challenges of of how you actually have, you know, how how you put things into these uh, incredibly high energy um, environments and how you get them to survive, and I, I'm thinking, you know, it's probably, you know, if we see one design that kind of works by 2030 and then you have to engineer it for um, replication and to make lots of them that probably takes you another 10 years and then you start building them so my number for 2050 for electricity is i'll be very happy to see one percent of global electricity produced by fusion by 2050 that would be a huge win for the industry in my book um, i invite you to uh, to come with me and i'll take you to a couple of um fusion companies that are building prototypes, building super uh, uh, high temperature uh, magnets. And um, it's really eye opening. And I'm very excited and would happy to sort of drag you along because it really turned me and impressed me. And I've been to said many, many of these sites. That, that is a fantastic invitation. It's one that I, uh, I would absolutely love to take you up on. And maybe we can work on that. Chris, it is always such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much, Michael. I really miss you. And, uh, um, looking forward to, uh, to your successes and, and uh, uh, hopefully we can solve some of these nuclear challenges. Thanks very much, Chris. Be well. Look after yourself. Thank you very much. You're well. Bye-bye. So that was Chris Skodomsky, Bloomberg NEF's lead nuclear analyst and adjunct assistant professor at the NYU Center for Global Affairs. And as always, you'll find links in the show notes to the episodes mentioned during today's conversation. So that's Fatih Birol, head of the International Energy Agency, episode 133, and Anika Khan, research fellow in nuclear fusion at Manchester University, episode 119. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to Cleaning Up, or leave us a review on your chosen podcast platform. And if you want more from Cleaning Up, Sign up for our free newsletter at cleaningup.live, where you'll find our archive of over 150 hours of conversation with extraordinary climate leaders. And why not help someone else learn more about the net zero transition by introducing them to Cleaning Up? Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gillardini Foundation.